With guests leaving the gallery, please note that the, the Parliament is still in session and I ask you to do so quietly, please. The next item of business today is a Member's Business Debate on Motion No. 9251 in the name of George Adam on MS Week 2014. Treat me right. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on George Adam to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Adam. Could we please have silence in the gallery? Mr Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Probably the noise in the gallery may be my own family. They're just getting overexcited at the thought of me debating here today. But uh, my own connection with MS, as most of you know, is through my wife, Stacey. Uh, Stacey. And as you can see in the gallery, she's up there. Obviously, it's almost like Romeo and Juliet at the moment with her there in the balcony. But, uh, and yes, we are just that romantic with one another. But Stacey was diagnosed at 16, and it was a life-changing uh, experience for her because no one knew about MS, GPs, the consultants, everything was quite difficult. Our family instantly went into a panic, uh, don't, didn't understand what it was. Our father actually just thought, oh, now we know it's MS. It was only when our mother explained to Tom that, uh, the life-changing aspect of it that he just broke down and understood. But Stacey went on to university and obviously eventually met the love of her life and uh, things got a lot better. But uh, Stacey is very positive uh, about our MS and how she goes on, as are just about everybody I know with multiple sclerosis. I don't think I've met one individual uh, with MS who actually sits there and complains or moans about the situation they're in. They want to actually be part of everything and get on with stuff. You know, I will actually apologise to some of my MSP colleagues that Stacey being the MS badge police uh, for the past week, where she's made sure that just about everyone has had to wear the MS Society badge. In fact, Rebecca Duff from uh, the MS Society Scotland said, I'm just glad she's on your side because she wouldn't like to be on the other side. But that's how passionate she is about making sure that we get the message out there. Because there are people who believe that, you know, sometimes MS isn't as high up the agenda as what it should be. So here we are in year three of Stacey's annual MS Awareness Week debate. And uh, I was, we've been talking to many of the people at the uh, event last night who families that are dealing with MS. And we've also been t uh, talking to uh, my, our own family have come here. They almost treat this as a busman's holiday when they come down here to, over here to see this. And my mother-in-law has always got this thing where she says, you know, if someone stopped me in Paisley High Street about insert said subject, I would say this. Now that normally means I've got to listen at this stage as she's trying to influence my opinion on various things that are happening in the world. So she said a few of these things and when we were discussing it, you know, that is part of the fraud problem with families when they're dealing with MS. It's the shock, it's uh, feeling alone, it's the ignorance of actually knowing what MS is. I think things have changed quite a bit and things are moving forward, but that is still an issue for a lot of families as well. Since last year, things have moved forward quite a bit with us creating this, the cross-party group on multiple sclerosis. Uh, my vice convener, Lewis MacDonald, is here as well. We have created uh, an agenda that we make sure that we're focused on what we can achieve, just to make sure that we have a work programme that can deliver something, to ensure that we're not just sitting here talking about or moaning, effectively, every quarter about things not happening. And I think that's been because of the MS Society, the partner organisations, and some of the people involved in MS getting involved with the government, with the parliament, and actually saying, wanting to make a difference. And I think that's the, the big difference for us. You know, the, what, one of the things that Neil Finlay said to me yesterday is, and it's quite an important part, is uh, many families uh, of MSPs have a family member who have MS. And I think that just is an example of a representation of what we are dealing with here in Scotland. You know, the, one of the meetings we had with the CPG, uh, the first meeting, we actually started to talk about the big issue became access to medicines. And this is a big, big issue at the moment. The situation we have is we need the pharmaceutical companies, the Scottish Government partner organisations and the NHS to work together to deliver uh, access. Because last year's report that the MS Society did as a lottery in treatment of care actually mentioned that only 36% of people living in Scotland have access to the medicines that alter the course of MS. And 29% said they did not have enough information about 
the, uh, the medicines. And that brings me to the people and families that are dealing with it on a regular basis. The MS Society in Scotland decided that they would go out and gather some evidence to find out exactly what their membership and people in Scotland were doing with regards to MS. And they went to Inverness, Airdrie, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Aberdeenshire and Dunfermline. And they spoke to people. And uh, the big issue, again, was access to drugs, being able to actually get the drugs they need. There was one woman who said, I've been on, and excuse my pronunciation, uh, to Sabri for five years, and it's made a huge difference to me. Although the treatment clinic I go to is quite a distance away, I see my MS specialist regularly, but this is partly because the treatment I'm on and there may be side effects. Another woman said, when planning my life and business, I don't need to worry about fridges for my syringes because now I'm on uh, Jelenia, which is a tablet, and she just takes it in her handbag now. She's got access to uh, dedicated staff, but she worries about other individuals as well, whether they have that same access. I will mention a wee wifey from Paisley, who I uh, spoke to in the high street, Rosemary Thompson, Stacey's mum, incidentally, and she said that she believes that more support to the person with MS is important at an early stage, more access to MS professionals, and GPs being better informed, because it's one of the issues that we constantly hear from people with MS, that GPs do not have the full information. Some of the support that is available through the therapy centres at like MS Revive in Glasgow offer the best type of support, where a lot of the time it's actually just listening and talking to people, giving them opportunity to maybe get, give them the further information. But we've been quite lucky as well. Stacey actually had a problem with her mobility, and she only got physiotherapy after she had a fall. And then they taught her, after 20 years of having MS, how to walk with crutches. Now, after 20 years, Stacey now knows how to walk with a crutch. These are all things that should be happening at an earlier stage. We heard last night from Elizabeth Quigley how, uh, how she really wants to see things move forward with uh, access to drugs in particular. But it's a two-way street. We have to have the drugs companies actually making the applications to the SMC to ensure that we can actually get the drugs as well, because Vampira has had a licence to 2012, and Sativex has had a licence to 2011, but they haven't done anything with it at this stage. And we have to make sure that these drugs are available. Last week at the CPG, Stacey said, it's like someone saying to you, there's the keys of a new designer house, or there's a new designer house, and not giving you the keys. And you can just look at it for five or ten years. It can't make that difference in your life. And she also said at one point, that's evil not giving us the access to these drugs. And I think that's important because one of the other things we often talk about as well is the fact that MS in Scotland, we have more per head per population than anyone else. It's a very Scottish disease. We say there's 11,000 people uh, dealing with MS in Scotland, but the problem is we don't know for sure. And I would say, presiding officer, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if he'd possibly look at uh, increasing the reporting for the Scottish MS register that was launched in 2010. Currently, it only registers people newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I think we need to expand that to ensure that we get people who have uh, everybody, everybody in throughout Scotland who has MS, because only then can we actually prescribe and treat people with MS when we know exactly where they are, exactly how many people there are, and that gives everyone the opportunity to do that. So, presiding officer, by starting to do all these things that I've said here today, I think only then we can start to treat people with MS right. Many thanks. Speeches of four minutes, please. I'd be grateful if members could stick to their time because the debate is heavily subscribed. Neil Finlay to be followed by Bob Doris. Thanks, President Officer, and can I apologise for having to leave uh, after my contribution. Um, I'd like to thank George Adam for putting down this motion for debate and for his work in getting the cross-party group and MS established and the MS Society for the very proactive work programme that they've put in place for that group. Um, I don't want to go over... Uh, the grim Scottish statistics on MS, uh, as this has been covered time and again when we debate this issue, uh, as we do annually. I want to focus on the impact of the illness and on the reality for sufferers. One of the things that concerns me most about the treatment of MS in Scotland is the unequal access to treatment. Only 36 per cent of sufferers with access to drugs that alter the course of MS, 25 per cent unable to see a neurologist when they need it. Six out of ten eligible people not taking disease-modifying drugs, many struggling financially with care costs, only a quarter in work, many like 
my brother having recently had to stop work as he physically couldn't continue with it. Uh, unequal access to specialist nurses, to emotional support, physiotherapy, continence advisors. Um, last night uh, I spoke to the only, the only MS social worker in Scotland, Dwayne Robertson, who works in Dundee. And of course, surprise, surprise, the poorest and most disadvantaged, suffering most and denied uh, access to the services. Uh, I had to watch recently a friend of mine who um, for several months experienced excruciating nerve pain that attacked his face, his mouth his, and his tongue, impacting on his ability to speak, destroying his quality of life, causing him to become housebound, lose weight and affect his social life. All the time he found himself left to his own devices with very little support and not wanting to ask for any. I also had to deal with a constituent with severe mobility problems who required a home visit from his dentist to carry out denture repair, yet no appointment could be made uh, for a whole month. Think about how that made him feel. Yet I hear of other areas where people have direct access to specialist nurses, phone numbers so they can contact someone directly for advice and support at any time, and access to other self, uh, services to help them manage their condition. Um, last night and this week, the MS Society are highlighting the further inequality that there is in access to medicines for licensed drugs. And the Scottish Government often compares Scotland with other countries, but in this area, then I think we wouldn't be so keen to make that comparison. 25th out of 27 in Europe with almost half the rate of access compared to Northern Ireland. And for people diagnosed, uh, they are supposed to see a specialist once every 12 months as a minimum. For many, this is still a very significant issue. And when they do see a specialist, the information on treatment, on new developments, as, as Elizabeth Quigley very eloquently uh, said last night, becomes a big secret. In my own area, we have an ability centre in uh, Livingston that has the uh, Krabis service, uh, that's a West Lothian uh, Community Rehabilitation and Brain Injury Service. It provides community-based specialist assessment and rehabilitation for people over the age, age of 16 who have either a physical disability or an acquired brain injury, and they include MS in their work. And they provide help with daily uh, living, mobility, communication, emotional support, social activity, and all the rest of it. But despite that being available locally in my community, GPs still do not refer people to it. Why is that? Why is something as simple as a referral to these support services not being made? Uh, my brother has never been referred to that service. The person I spoke about who had the excruciating nerve pain never been referred to that service. The minister made some very positive statements last night and they were very welcome. Uh, let's hope that those words result in action. But I think from all in the MS uh, uh, cross-party group, I'm sure we will be saying, Minister, we will be watching. Many thanks. And I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Uh, Presiding officer, um, can I start by thanking George Adam for, for bringing this, this member's debate be, before us this afternoon. Uh, I hope to make a, make a, a brief contribution um, my connection with MS is not a family member. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that it's not a family member because so many people that I've met in, uh, over the years have had a family member who have had to uh, not just suffer with MS but actually find a way of living positively with MS as well. And I think that's really important. And I want to talk about an organisation in my constituency called Revive MS, which George Adam referred to. I actually visited it because it was, it was down the road from my house and lots of my constituents worked there. So as an MSP, as you do, you go along. But I was absolutely blown away with what they do there. The first thing they told me is, uh, look, Bob, we're not here just to talk about what's wrong with people. We're here to uh, give them a place to hang out, to give them a place for family members and uh, not just those who have the condition of MS. We're there to make sure whether you want aromatherapy or a massage or access to an MS specialist or whatever, a holistic approach to those living with and those who have relatives living with MS. And what they do is, is quite spectacular. Um, they do a series of outreach um, uh, services across the west of, of Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will have written to them recently about Revive MS, because such is their success, they've outgrown uh, their Maryhill base, and they're looking to, to co-locate 
Besides uh, the Southern General Hospital, they're hoping to invest in and buy a property there, and they've started was their, their launch fundraising dinner, where they're hoping to raise £850,000 to enable them to do that. And I know my colleague George Adams already written to, to John Swinney in relation to how we can sustain such excellent third sector organisations, and I've written to, 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 to Mr Neil in relation to that as well. They tell me that they are confident they can get many trusts and charitable organisations to donate to that campaign to £850,000 to get this, this, this excellent new centre developed. But what they also tell me is any Scottish Government money, even a small amount of money, would be hugely powerful in leveraging in additional monies from elsewhere. Um, and I'll just leave it sitting at that, but I would not be, uh, I'd be doing a disservice to revive MS and to my constituents if I didn't mention that during during this debate. So I have done that now, Cabinet Secretary, and I hope you will agree to meet with myself and, and George Adam in relation to work out how we can take that forward. The other thing I want to talk about is access to medicines and treatments. As Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee, I am incredibly proud of the, the cross-party approach we took to the access to, to new medicines in Scotland. Our committee got our teeth into that issue, and it ceased to be a case of um, tabloid newspapers reporting which part of the UK could get one medicine, which part of the UK couldn't. We just looked at improving the system to make it work for the people of Scotland, and that's kicking in now, and it will work for the people of Scotland. But I am concerned that there could be pharmaceutical companies out there who have life-enhancing drugs for those living with MS and they're not making applications to the Scottish Med Medicines Consortium for whatever reason. And I know the SMC are, are world class at doing scoping, uh, scoping exercises to identify drugs that could be of benefit to the people of Scotland and encouraging people and companies to deliver the, the evidence to have it approved by the, the SMC. But I understand two companies specifically haven't done that. So just very specifically, Cabinet Secretary, anything you can do in relation to these companies and the SMC to bring forward these submissions, I would be very welcome as well, because I believe we now have a first-class system in Scotland, but it can only work if the pharmaceutical companies actually bring forward their medicines for consideration. So just two points, and I said it would be brief now over my time, so I apologise, Presiding Officer, but I hope you'll take these on board during your summing up. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too congratulate uh, George Adam on securing this debate? In fact, more than that, can I congratulate him, in fact, on becoming a champion for this issue in the Scottish Parliament? Because I think that by having a champion for issues like this, there is just that added dimension and impetus, which I hope will lead to the very progress that I think this debate is designed to achieve. Now, he began by saying that this was a Romeo and Juliet occasion with his wife Stacey perched on the balcony. So we will check the wall afterwards for messages of endearment having been posted. As is, as is the custom and habit. But I, I, I think the problem we have is that multiple sclerosis is a condition about which everyone is really aware. I think it's one of the conditions that most people on the street would say, oh, MS, yes, multiple sclerosis. But what I and others, I think, have perhaps totally underestimated or made unfounded assumptions about was the quality of the treatment that was available for people who suffered from multiple sclerosis. And I think that what is becoming apparent is that in a number of ways it is deficient, and certainly deficient beyond that that some lesser known conditions have actually managed to achieve by a focused uh, a promotion of the particular agenda underpinning that. The reality is depressingly and unacceptably different. It may be matched, and I was pleased to hear it, by the positivity of sufferers who are determined to make the very most and the best potential of the life they had. But actually, none of us can really be happy that Scotland languishes near next to the bottom in a league of international countries in terms of the treatment and the availability of treatment and the success of that treatment that we have. Now, there seem to be a number of issues at hand. Firstly, there is the poor dissemination of information about the disease and also the restricted quality of the service. And a number of members, George Adam went through the particular drugs in question, have cited the access uh, to medicines, especially the symptomatic medicines. The fact that we have a number of license, uh, medicines licensed which are not actually being prescribed, and we have a number of medicines that exist for which licenses are not actually being sought. And that is slightly 
unfortunate and ironic because, of course, so much of the focus when we have been talking about access to new medicines in the last three or four years has all been about cancer drugs, that we've to some extent undermined, under, undervalued and overlooked the fact that there are so many other conditions for which the access and the prescribing of medicines which can make a qualitative improvement now to a disease for which people have been seeking qualitative improvements for generations, um, and they're there, as was illustrated in the terms of the designer house, they are there but not being given access to those who need them. The second is access on a proactive basis to regular consultant services. That should be not something people uh, don't realise they are entitled to, but something to which they are routinely offered access. And I hope that is a, a, an improvement that we can see. I welcome the government announcement made last night about further enhancement to the services and offer. Uh, but I think we should also be doing more to actually advertise, and I think the National Register would be a prerequisite of this, to all those who are sufferers, the various treatments that are available to what we imagine to be around 11,000 sufferers in Scotland. Now, I was at the committee that approved the establishment of the cross-party group on uh, multiple sclerosis. And I have to say, like many members, uh, I sometimes wonder whether we don't have just that many, too, too many uh, cross-party groups in this parliament. But what impressed those of us there at the time was the underlying commitment of George Adam to ensure that this cross-party group had a direct focus. And I think that direct focus is already producing an agenda that we hopefully can see translated into results. I'm sorry I was unable to be at the function last night. No slight was intended to that at all. I, like others, know people who have suffered or do suffer from the condition. It has my support. The focus on the Treat Me Right campaign will enjoy the support of this party. And I wish George Adam every success and the cross-party group in working with the Cabinet Secretary and the Government to make the progress we all wish to see. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, presiding officer, I'd also like to congratulate George Adam on bringing forward this motion and, of course, for being, as Jackson Carlo said, a champion uh, of uh, MS uh, issues uh, in this uh, parliament. I myself certainly don't have any uh, great experience or, or expertise in this, although I am, like Bob Doris, very pleased to have a great voluntary sector uh, organisation there, the MS Therapy Centre, uh, based in my constituency. And, and thanks to all the members who supported uh, my motion on that recently, where I was praising their support services and innovative therapies that they uh, offer to people with MS uh, in Edinburgh and the Lothians uh, more uh, generally. And also, of course, I was praising the dedicated and diligent care of the centre staff and its uh, volunteers. So I think the voluntary sector is very important uh, to the whole issue of MS. And we've been very privileged this week to have the MS Society in the Parliament. Uh, we've been able to talk to them, but also read the various materials that they presented, in particular that they've been telling us about their campaign uh, called the Treat Me Right campaign. And I was very interested to read uh, the research that uh, lay behind that campaign and then, of course, the particular recommendations, uh, or perhaps I should say demands, that the campaign uh, has been making. I thought two pieces of information from the research were particularly interesting. One, and I think this was a UK-wide, six out of ten people was relapsing MS uh, or not taking medicines that can alter uh, the course of the condition. And I suppose that probably corresponds to the 36% uh, of people in Scotland who are getting uh, um, the, the drugs that would benefit them. But the other very interesting piece of uh, information from the research I found was that people uh, who feel both informed about the medicines and, crucially, who say they have regular access to an MS specialist are far more likely to be in treatment. And there was an astonishing contrast there between 69% of those people uh, and 7% of the other people. So those clearly, uh, that clearly highlighted a very important issue. And that led, of course, to the four uh, recommendations. Firstly, that all licensed treatments should be approved and available. And on this occasion, and this is great to know, it's not the SMC that's being criticised, uh, but in fact, uh, in some cases, the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies who've not uh, put forward uh, their drugs for uh, approval by uh, the SMC and in fact the SMP should be praised because they've actually approved uh, two new drugs uh, recently. But crucially they then uh, go on to, uh, to, to say that people with relapsing MF should be informed about the option and discuss with a specialist recommendation too which is related to recommendation three that everyone should be invited to a regular review by an MHS specialist. So that really is a key issue I think Again, credit to the government for having the neurological standards, one of which is uh, invited uh, uh, to a review with a specialist every 12 months. But we know that that is not happening in every case.
case, the 2012 um, health service, uh, neurological health service report said a quarter of people were not able to see a neurologist when they required. So that's clearly an area that needs uh, some attention. And uh, also, of course, a related recommendation is about access to a multidisciplinary team. And I think the, the nurse specialists for MS are particularly important in that regard. And again, about half the people affected have that access and half don't. So there is clearly more to do, but credit to the government for uh, having the standards uh, and, and the group that's now overseeing their implementation. Finally, though, I thought the last recommendation was equally important. All people with MS should be supported to be equal partners in decision-making about their treatment. And that's obviously an important general principle for the health service uh, linked to patient participations and the patient groups that support them. And I was interested talking to the MS Society today that they emphasized obviously not just the importance of their own organization, but, obviously, but also of the Neurological Alliance of which they are a member, because they said many of the issues actually affected a whole range of neurological services. So it's clearly important also that the Neurological Alliance and the Neurological Voices campaign, which they have spawned, uh, the Neurological Voices Project, I should say, which they have spawned, should also uh, receive support from the Scottish Government. Many thanks. Just before I call Jim Hume, can I advise Parliament that due to the number of members who still wish to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion from George Adam under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Adam? Yes, proposed. Thank you very much. Um, that has been moved by Mr Adam and does Parliament agree? We do. I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too start by congratulating George Adam in securing this debate in this MS week and also congratulate him for taking as long as two minutes into his speech before he actually mentioned Paisley, which is a, a record long time, I think. But he did manage to get it in twice, so well done on that too. <laughs> it's true that Scotland has one of the highest incidences of MS in the world. Sadly, it remains unclear why that should be. Diet, genetics, environment or a combination might be the case. I speak in this debate this afternoon from a heartfelt perspective. At the end of the last session, there were concerns that Lukey MS Respite Centre in, in my region may close because of funding. The users and their families who needed the vital respite care it provides from across Scotland, North, North England, and even people from the continent used it. They faced losing that invaluable service. Ian Gray, Jackie Bailey and myself all supported the campaign. Jackie Bailey hosted a members debate on the issue and I'm glad that the cross-party campaigning and support of the work of Mary O'Keefe and her team ended with Logie House being saved to the benefit of people with MS and other conditions now. But MS sufferers don't just need respite, they need treatment. Concerns have been raised about the treatment of sufferers by different health boards. I share the view that health boards need to keep data as to treatments given by their various health professionals, time taken to treatment, and from that we can then see where we need to target improvements so that no MS sufferer in Scotland should be at a disadvantage to another just because of where they live. Once we have the data, we can then share the best practice across health board regions and look to improve the care for people with MS. If that doesn't work, then I think perhaps we should look at heat targets for treatments offered and waiting times to be treated. These ideas were discussed at the recently formed CPG on MS, which I'm glad to be a member of. Other concerns shared were follow-up doctor appointments after a patient is diagnosed with MS. I share that concern. During the cross-party group, we heard that often a doctor would diagnose someone with MS, but because the patient was at the very early stages of the conditions, no recommendation was made for any initial treatment. The patient could then go home, and because MS may slowly get worse, sometimes several years down the line, the patient could have missed out on new treatments or early intervention. It's therefore vital, I think, that doctor practices have in place a best practice system which ensures that at a set time they invite the MS patient back in for a review to see if the condition has progressed or not. At the CPG, there was a frustration that many innovative new drugs were not available to them, but we heard from the industry that they had a due process and testing finished on them, a kind of chicken and egg situation, I suppose. And of course, we cannot freely license drugs without some due process, and there are some horror stories from the past when due pro process hadn't been enough. But what I would like to see is that people with MS, wherever they are in Scotland, are informed of all the options available to them, whether through drugs or therapy centres, 
like the excellent example mentioned by Malcolm Chisholm, just a mile from here in the form of the MS Therapy Centre Lothian, where Nancy Campbell and her team help people, uh, not just from the Lothians, but Fife and the Borders also use that uh, great centre. So we must ensure there isn't a postcode lottery. Diagnosis and treatment must be achieved timelessly with regular reviews of patient progress. So I look forward to working with the CPG on MFs and the Society on these matters in the future. And I look for assurances today from the Cabinet Secretary that this disease, given its prevalence in Scotland, will be treated with the urgency its sufferers deserve. Many thanks. And I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also congratulate George Adam and echo the people in the Chamber this afternoon who have complimented him on the work that he does, the work of the cross-party group, and indeed um, the excellent information that has been made available to us during MS Week this week, and indeed the very successful reception last night, which was excellently attended. I don't often speak in health debates. I'm not in the health committee and by no means an expert in that area. I'm lucky that throughout my working life, I have been able to seek expert advice from my big sister. So whether that was as an IT professional who worked in, in dealing with GT, GP um, systems and GP fund holding systems, or indeed in health related issues, um, I have always sought my big sister's support. My older sister Eileen has been a GP in England for over 30 years and is a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. She, as well as her GP duties, she also trains and examines GPs on behalf of the college. But in seeking her support today and her help for this debate, it was also her experience as an MS sufferer of over 30 years. And despite being part of the medical profession, and albeit an English patient, I think my sister's own experience echoes many of the testaments that have been given, brought forward by the MS Society, that of um, a lack of coherence, no golden um, pathway through um, diagnosis and support for the disease. And um, because of the nature of the disease, seeing different consultants as the disease pro progresses makes it very difficult to build that rapport that would enable someone to discuss and, and talk through the, the options and possibilities moving forward with the disease. I was delighted to learn so much at last night's event. Um, and I think um, in, in the debate this afternoon, many people have talked about the, the symptoms, and Neil Finlay made a, a very powerful um, speech about the symptoms of MS sufferers. But I think we should also highlight today to people um, who maybe don't understand the disease as much as those who, who live with it and, the, and their families and, and friends and carers, in that these are extremely powerful drugs. And we maybe don't talk about the effects that the treatment itself can have on MS sufferers. When we talk about disease-modifying drugs, um, it wasn't until my sister described her treatment as chemotherapy it struck me because chemotherapy brings that home to us uh, because it's normally associated with cancer treatment, how um, powerful a, a, a drug it can be. And um, in my own sister's case, and for many, many sufferers, I think the choice um, that they have to make every single day to take a treatment that they know will make them feel awful for, in the short term for what may be a not a guaranteed long time gain. So I was particularly interested last night to learn about the tablet forms of um, DMD, um, DMDs because I had, had not realised, um, because my, my own sister's experience has been uh, on injections and all the associated problems mentioned about needing fridges and travel and all these things that um, you know, we, we maybe don't understand um, as, as part of the disease. So... Um, my sister um, spoke, she, she's very lucky, she's still working and she was attending a Pilates class the other day for people with various types of um, uh, diseases that um, benefit from, from um, sort of this type of um, therapy and she asked them about what, what they would want me to say today about what the experience they have of being, being um, sufferers and um, it, it was all about getting everything right. It's not just about the medicine, it's about all the support services as discussed by other people today and, and really that um, confidence to know 
that they're making the right decisions themselves in conjunction with their medical practitioners about the options going forward. So I think the Treat Me Right campaign is fantastic and will take this whole debate forward. And I thank everyone who's been involved in this process for this week and, and look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's response. Many thanks. And I now call John Finney to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I too would like to congratulate George Adam. Thank him for his work throughout the year. Likewise, the MS Society and the, the various uh, MS therapy centres and other treatment centres around the country. I want to give a particular example about a constituent. I hopefully I'm going to say nothing would remotely identify the individual, but I think it graphically illustrates um, some of the issues. It was in May of uh, last year, approached by a young woman, the mother of a, a preschool, uh, preschool child. She had been prescribed famprodine by a neurologist. Um, she suffers a lack of mobility, and this was a drug that would help with uh, walking speed. The pharmacy had refused the medication, the medication but uh, she was told that she would be able to uh, self-fund at the cost of £250 per month. Now, she was aware that this particular drug didn't have SMC approval. Um, and as has been said of others, like many MS sufferers, are very well informed. And at that stage, she was currently appealing. And the notes that uh, Linda, who works in my office, had was uh, upset, knows the drug may not necessarily make her quality of life better, but feels she should be given a chance. So at that point, the treat me right, I think, would be highly appropriate. The end of June, the appeal's still not gone through, but the young woman had started and was got in touch to tell me that she was in the third week or four weeks of a trial. Cabinet Secretary alludes to this in a letter, a subsequent item, and quite rightly it says that that was a private arrangement. Um, she, she says, I have really positive results. This is great. I'm preparing myself for having to not take it as I can't afford it, and until pharmacy approves funding, I'll not be able to stay on it. She's offered face-to-face um, -face meetings with various people, uh, um, but declines this, uh, asking for information in writing, because she doesn't have the necessary mobility to get there. I wrote a letter supporting the, the appeal suggesting that wider uh, aspects should be considered, and I'll come on to them later. Uh, and uh, on the 16th of August, the appeal fails. Um, further representations are made. Uh, I write to the um, Individual Patient Treatment Request Coordinator about procedural issues. I write to the Cabinet Secretary about some general questions about drugs and treatment, and, and, and I get a, a very comprehensive response. I write to the company, Biogen, uh, who tell me they hope to have data which will be available at some point in the future, and I'd be very keen to get the paperwork in for that particular drug. Um, but moving on and missing out a lot of trauma in between, on the 19th of uh, December, I, I get a lovely email that says, last night's the first good night's sleep I've had in months. Great news to have before Christmas and New Year. Now, these are months of anguish, and uh, the, the private arrangements called the Responder identif Identification Scheme, and I don't think people are interested in what it's called. It might be considered a, a prescription. I think there's a lot of uh, phrases, buzzwords that, that we use a lot in this chamber here. Gerfic, um, we talk about the integration of health and social care. We talk about holistic approaches. And I think I'm not for one minute suggesting, in fact, quite the reverse, that this uh, young woman's child was brilliantly looked after and two loving parents, but it can have an impact. The prescri prescribing of the drugs has a positive impact, not only in the child, but also uh, and, and the rest of the family. Um, we also talk about preventative spend and looked in the broadest sense uh, that that's terribly important. Prescriptions have been referred to in this chamber and I agree with the term as a, as a, a tax on the sick. Um, and I think, as I've said, in the finer points of debate, people aren't really bothered about procedures. They want to be treated properly. L like many others, I took a lot of reassurance from what the minister said last night. At the reception last night was Dr Michael Foxley, a former council colleague who's, who's very involved. And he echoed what a lot of people said, and that is that MS sufferers have a lot of positive uh, attitude. Um, I think with the positive attitude we heard from the Minister last night, there is progress going forward. I can tell you that the, the, the woman continues to do very well, and I hope that's an example that can be followed um, elsewhere. So thanks again to George for bringing the debate. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, and I too congratulate George Adam for bringing this debate and for his proactive role in setting up our cross-party group. Multiple sclerosis impacts on thousands of people across Scotland, but nowhere more so than in the North East and the Northern Isles. The proportion of people in Aberdeen with MS is 20% above the Scottish average. The proportion in Orkney 
uh, is more than double. And Grampian sharing some health services with Orkney and Shetland has a particular responsibility to give a lead in the support of people uh, with MS. And in many ways, NHS Grampian does that job well. Marshall e. Craig, who is a trustee of the MS Society and who was at the reception here yesterday evening, often says that if you're going to have MS, Aberdeen is not a bad place to have it. That says quite a lot about the positive attitude of Marshall e. and indeed of many other people with MS, as we have heard. But it also reflects the good access to services and the excellent support from staff, uh, which is the experience of many in Grampian. Critical to that is the continuing provision of good quality neurological services at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, something which must not be compromised by any temptation to centralise services towards the central belt. Critical also is the outstanding service provided by MS nurses in Grampian. Any temptation to cut costs here would immediately be self-defeating because the support of MS nurses is not only clinical good practice, uh, it's also cost-effective in the work it does in reducing the need for hospital admissions. The Horizons Rehabilitation Centre in Aberdeen provides a very valuable service for people with a range of neurological conditions, uh, though only for those recovering from relapses. Increasing access to those services would actually be, again, cost effective, uh, as good physiotherapy support can help people to maintain mobility and to manage their symptoms. And, and, and of course, the Stewart Resource Centre, funded by the MS Society itself in Aberdeen, is also invaluable in the support it provides and, and deserves their continuing support. So Aberdeen is not a bad place to have MS in some respects, but not in all. It is true that NHS Grampian was ahead of the game in prescribing beta interferon for MS patients from an early stage, but more recently, access to treatments has been less readily available. Anne Ferguson from Tuch in Aberdeenshire can vouch for that. Her consultant at ARI recommended five years ago uh, that she should have access to the drug Sativex uh, to deal with the involuntary spasms, which for her are the most significant symptom of her MS. In the absence of approval by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, an individual patient treatment request was made to NHS Grampian on her behalf. It was refused, an appeal was lodged. That too was unsuccessful. And three years ago, Anne's GP wrote her a private prescription for Sativex, but again, NHS Grampian instructed him uh, that it was not uh, suitable for prescribing uh, within their area. And a constituent told me yesterday of similar difficulty in obtaining a prescription for Fanfredine, either in Aberdeen or in Glasgow, even though he is himself a health service professional and was willing to pay for it himself. These, acts, these issues of access to treatment are not local, uh, they are national. And as we have heard, people with MS have better access in all but two of the other member states of the European Union. And ultimately, these issues of access are for ministers to resolve. That's why it was good to hear Michael Matheson yesterday evening make a pledge on the record to say that people with MS should receive the right treatment at the right time. That will require early and positive actions by the manufacturers and early and positive decisions by the SMC which is, of course, ultimately the responsibility of ministers. So my constituents and thousands of others will look to all concerned for rapid progress on these issues, as will members across this chamber. And I look forward to hearing from the Cabinet Secretary just how he intends that his government will carry out the promise uh, which they gave us uh, last night. Thank you. Many thanks. And our final open debate speaker is James Jordan. Thank you very much, President Officer. And like everybody else in the Chamber, I'd like to thank George and Stacey for, for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Uh, it's been a very informative week. The stall uh, and the event last night taught me a lot of things I didn't know about MS before. And for that, I thank everybody involved. My, my colleague Bob Doris has already described in great detail a lot about the work that Revive MS do, so I won't dwell too much on that. However, just to say that I've been fortunate to see some of the work that the local branch does in my own constituency, where they meet in Cathcart Trinity Church every Friday. I know that the local Revive group is a lifeline for many people with MS across the south of the city, and I was reminded of this a few months ago when I met an old friend of mine. I hadn't seen him for ages. He looked great, still fit and healthy. And that's what I'd have expected. This guy was a great footballer, and I mean great, classy, energetic, and played well in his 30s and I believe in his 40s. So you can imagine my surprise when he told me that he'd heard of my visit to his organisation as he'd suffered from MS and was a member. This just brought home to me how little I really knew about MS, who it affects, why it affects them, and what we can do to make life easier for those who suffer from it. 
Now, the access to drugs and other matters have been dealt with by others, so I don't want to deal with that, and I know it's getting on. So. But colleagues across the chamber might remember that last September I held a members' debate on a report by Independent Living in Scotland on widening access to politics. During this debate, I spoke of my desire for the Parliament to implement some kind of programme for people with disabilities. I wrote to the presiding officer, and out of the support and guidance I received from her, we have managed to bring about a parliamentary internship programme for people with disabilities, funded by the Scottish Government through SEVO Inclusion Scotland, and ably supported in Parliament by our fantastic equalities team. And that's important because when I suggested the idea of an internship, it was because I firmly believe that we make better decisions as a parliament if we have many voices and experiences articulated both in the chamber and through the people that we meet in our role as MSPs. Inclusion Scotland have secured funding from the Scottish Government for another six interns over the course of the next 10 to 12 months. And we're having an event in parliament at the end of this month to discuss the internship and how members can get involved. I'll discuss this in greater detail then. But I'm sure there will be plenty of interest from my colleagues across the chamber in participating in this internship programme. And I bring this up because the first intern for the programme, Katrina Johnson, has recently been appointed and will begin in my office in the next couple of weeks. Katrina had to go through a rigorous selection process against some very formidable candidates, and she won through because she deserved to. Katrina's MS. Many of you will have met her. She's been one of the people in the MS stall in the garden lobby this week and was at the event last night. I have now had the good fortune to meet, meet up with her on a few occasions, and it is clear that Katrina, like so many others suffering from MS, will not be defined or curtailed in her ambitions by her condition. I have no doubt that she will bring a great deal to my office and be a great role model for those interns who will follow in her footsteps. We are both looking forward to this internship starting for Katrina to get a sense about what Parliament is like, and for me to try to grasp some of the everyday problems somebody with MS may well have to deal with. One of the important roles in this programme is for interns to undertake a project, and I am going to discuss with Katrina the idea of looking into in greater detail the reason why manufacturers are reluctant to put the drugs out to review by the SMC, and what impact decisions like this have on those suffering from the affected condition. We will pass the information on to yourself, Cabinet Secretary, when we are done. Signed officer, I fully support the aims of the Treat Me Right campaign, and it is clear that there is broad support across the Chamber to move forward with this to try and get the answers to ensure that folk with MS across the country are afforded the quality of and access to care that they fully deserve. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now invite Alex Neil to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, in around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, James Dorman thanked uh, George and Stacey. I would like to thank Stacey and George. Uh, because Stacey's influence on this, uh, I think, is well known, and uh, I think this debate is very appropriate. And although, unfortunately, I could meet the reception last night because I was travelling back from Brussels, uh, I do believe that it was a very successful event. I would also like to congratulate the MS Society. I think that deserves enormous credit for the contribution it makes to improving the lives of people with MS, and they continue to play a vital role in promoting new research and in raising awareness of the condition. I will try throughout my speech to answer some of the very specific points made, and I'll begin by, first of all, saying to Jim Hume, we have provided now three-year funding for Lucky House, which I'm sure he will welcome, uh, and also, although he's uh, no longer uh, here, Bob Doris, to confirm that either Michael Matheson or myself would be happy to meet uh, with um, the uh, Revive MS group. I met with them last year and uh, we supported them with just over £21,000 worth of funding. So uh, more than happy to meet with them uh, again. Uh, either Michael or I will do that. Uh, when it comes to medicines in the register, I will try to answer those points as I get through my notes. I think very clearly the access to treatment is a, a major issue that's been highlighted today, and the MS Society's Treat Me Right campaign uh, for appropriate treatments is particularly important. And of course, they emphasise the need for disease-modifying drugs for people with relapsing and remitting MS, which can help manage relapses and the impact of these relapses. Symptom management treatments for people with either relapsing or progressive MS, which can help manage some of the symptoms of MS, including specificity, walking speed and incontinence. And we want to see engagement by the pharmaceutical industry with the Scottish Medicines Consortium. And can I just make two points here? Uh, first of all, I am happy to take the initiative uh, in contacting the companies who have yet to apply to SMC for acceptability of licensed products. 
I do accept the general principles that our objective should be to have all licensed products available uh, to MS sufferers through the SMC process. Uh, so I would like to emphasise that. Uh, secondly, I would make the point, particularly to Lewis uh, and his contribution, that hopefully as a result of the recent reforms introduced into the SMC process, including the replacement of the IPTR process by the PAC process, that we will see significant improvements in terms of reducing any and eliminating any postcode lottery in terms of the availability of these drugs. As Jackson Carlo said, although much of that, those changes were motivated by cancer-related drugs, we are very conscious that the changes relate to MS and indeed a whole host of other uh, ailments, including cystic fibrosis. So let me underline our commitment to deal with that situation. Cabinet Secretary, could I stop you just for a moment? Sorry to interrupt. It's just that you, you have referred to a number of members just by their first names, and whilst we would be aware of who Michael, for example, right. would be Michael Matheson, MSP, perhaps for the record, we could, and also for those watching the proceedings, we could just clarify yeah. by referring to members by their full names. Lewis Thank is you. Lewis MacDonald and Jackson is Jackson Carlo. Uh, with regard to access to specialists as a government, we recognise the vital importance of seeing the right person at the right time in the right place. And I had the pleasure recently, or Michael had, of, re, of speaking at the National Neurological Advisory Group Learning and Sharing event. Uh, and that group was formed to take forward work to ensure continued improvements in neurological care, including for those living with MS. Access to specialists in an area that has been recognised by them as a continuing priority, and they're taking forward work in this area. And can I say, as part of the announcement uh, Michael Matheson made last night, I am very keen that we tackle the issue of variation between different health board areas in terms of access to treatment and access to the necessary resources. We last week published uh, an audit of chronic pain services right across Scotland, looking at the variation between different board areas. I am keen that we do the same with MS with a view to eliminating those variations so that everybody gets first class treatment irrespective of where they live in Scotland. I think that's extremely important. Uh, and it's also important, obviously, that we've got the right skill mix, the right number of people in the right place at the right time, and obviously, uh, we, we are very keen to ensure, particularly in terms of neurological resources, that that's the case. There will be six trainee neurologist posts advertised in the 2014 recruitment round, uh, which will be filled via national recruitment. And that will be a further enhancement in terms of the neurological resource available for patients. In terms of access to information, the Treat Me Right campaign also quite rightly highlights the essential need for people with MS to receive the advice and information they need in order to make informed decisions about their care and treatment. Again, the National Advisory Group are well placed to identify and address any gaps in the provision of information that supports people to make these decisions. Also ensuring that clinicians across Scotland consistently provide high quality information that can support not only decisions about treatment, but also support people to self-manage their condition. And this will be taken forward through the work in care pathways and patient experience. I'm pleased to hear that the MS Society is an integral member of the advisory group uh, and through the group well positioned to help shape the delivery of neurological services. Let me come now to the MS Register. As a government, we recognise that data is an essential element to delivering improvement. Uh, we have provided funding of £70,000 to support the establishment of the Scottish MS Register, which commenced work at the beginning of 2010. The register was set up to gather reliable data which would establish the incidence of MS in Scotland. The MS Society has also provided funding to support the register and has been involved in, in it since its inception to ensure that it has people with MS as its focus. The register is hosted by NHS National Services Information Services Division, ISD, and in 2013 it published its first national report. They have provided assurance that MS clinical the MS clinical community is fully engaged in the register. SMR01 data is being used to measure data completeness and potentially identify patients who have not been reported to the register. 
The data collected is used to produce quality feedback reports, which are provided to MS teams, and they include all known patients given a confirmed diagnosis of MS in the last 12 months. However, I do agree with the point made by George Adam in his speech that we should look to expanding the register eventually to include every MS sufferer in Scotland, and I undertake to take forward that specific action point, as well as the others I've mentioned from the debate today, uh, because I'm very, very conscious of the benefits of comprehensive registers in taking forward treatment and indeed the research for finding cures for conditions like MS. The register also monitors the referral process from time of diagnosis to contact with an MS nurse and boards can use the report to assess which stage in the referral process needs to be improved. So in terms of all of these areas, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do believe we are making substantial progress, but there is further substantial progress to be made. But let me underline, and I think this is right across all the parties in this chamber, I think we're all at one in this, in recognising that Scotland, unfortunately, is the world capital for MS in terms of its incidence. I think there's therefore a particular onus on all of us to do whatever we can uh, to make uh, life as comfortable as possible and as easy as possible and as high quality as possible for sufferers. But obviously, the ultimate goal must be to find a cure. Thank you. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. For the record, could I just inform Parliament that Bob Doris did apologise to myself and the Chamber for having to leave early. That concludes George Adams' debate, MS Week 2014, Treat Me Right. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm. <laughs>